This morning we are continuing on in a series of messages we are calling Long Story Short. Let me ask you a question. Has anyone ever told you a story that started out with those words, Long Story Short? You know, as soon as someone says it, you know you're in for the long haul. So grab a seat and pretend to listen. Well, in our current sermon series, we are taking the biblical narrative, a long story covered over 66 books, and making it short. Really, we're, we're making it short. You know, the reality of the Bible uh, is that it can be very intimidating. It's ancient, it's enormous, and sometimes it's even challenging to understand. However, in this series, Pastor Brian and I want you to see the Bible not so much as a complex list of rules or doctrine, but rather we want you to see it as a single drama, a story in six easy-to-remember movements. So if someone were to ask you to explain for them the plot line of the Bible, our hope by the end of this series is you'll be able to say something like this. Well, it all started with God creating everything in perfect harmony. However, humanity ruined everything when they distrusted God's goodness and truth and disobeyed. This was called the fall. But even in our disobedience, God set out to save us from our sins. That plan of salvation began through a people group called Israel and culminated in the person and work of Jesus. It was on the cross that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins and when he rose from the grave, he defeated death. And he promises to come back and restore all things. But first, he created a new people group called the church that would serve as his hands and his feet in a world calling all people to faith in him. Finally, when Christ returns, he will indeed restore all things to wholeness and bring a new creation that has no sin and no death. Friends, this is our long story made short. So in our series, we first looked at creation. It was in this first movement we come to realize that we were made from community and for community. Said more simply, relationship matters. More than anything, friends, how we relate to God and with one another matters. Next, we have the fall. We learn that perfect communion with God and with each other got broken when Adam and Eve, through an act of disobedience, bit into a forbidden fruit. As heart-wrenching as that moment in the biblical narrative was, God did not leave us without mercy. Now, even as God was punishing the man, the woman, and the snake for their part to play in breaking all things, he extends mercy. We see this in a really famous verse in Genesis 3, verse 15. It's this incredible verse that we see the first mention of the gospel, the good news. When God makes his promise to send a son, a savior, who would crush sin, who would defeat death. Well, the third movement of this incredible drama is found in the calling of a man. A man who would be the patriarch of a people group that God would use as he began to carry out his plan of salvation. That man's name was Abram, and his wife's name was Sarai. I want to invite Logan to read for us the start of their narrative in the midst of God's story. Today's reading is from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Marah. At the time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To you, to your offspring, I will give this land. So here he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. This is God's word for God people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. 
Gracious and loving God, I ask that in the midst of these next few moments that you bless the words of my lips, the meditation of all our hearts, that they be a profit to us and acceptable to you, for you indeed are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Suppose that somebody gave you the task of fixing all the problems in the world. Now, in case I wasn't clear, that means everything from hunger to greed to racism to poverty to even long lines at the restroom. Where would you begin? Or better yet, who would you choose to help you? You know, in the Bible, we're surprised to discover that God's plan to save creation starts in the unlikeliest of places. You know, he doesn't call a king or an army general. He doesn't call a rock star or a preacher. Instead, he calls an old man that is well past his prime. He calls Abram. God uh, comes to Abram late in his life with a peculiar message. He says, Abram, I want you to take a trip. And with that, a new chapter in God's story opens with just two words. Abram went. The call of Abram marks the start of God's grand rescue operation known as Israel. This rescue operation comes to deal with the problems of sin and death that have entered into the story in Genesis 3. You know, one great reality that we see in this chapter of God's long story short is a reality we see really throughout the entirety of Scripture, and here it is. When God wants to solve a problem, church, he likes to use the most unlikely of people. So what we have from Genesis 3 to Genesis 11 is this snowballing effect of sin as it goes from individual person sinning to sin becoming a systemic problem. So God decides to choose a person by the name of Abram, soon his name will be Abraham, who along with his wife Sarah would be the patriarch and matriarch of a huge family. God told Abraham and Sarah that it would be through their descendants that he would bless all the nations of the earth. Now, in the biblical narrative, this is where we see a big theological term called election. It's a, a type of election is not what you do at a voting booth when you're voting for government officials, but rather div, uh, divine election is this idea that, uh, that when God works, he often chooses one out of the many, hear this, for the sake of the many. So he chooses Abraham and his descendants to be the ones that would bring redemption and the good news of a Savior to all the nations of the earth. So to reiterate, in the Bible, election is not God choosing one instead of others, but rather God choosing one for the sake of the others. And and what we see, uh, we see that again in Israel, the, the Israel chapter of the biblical narrative. Israel would be the one people group that God would use for the sake and the benefit of all people groups. The point here is redemptive. It's this idea that through God's choice of Israel, all nations, races, tribes, and tongues would have access to salvation. Friends, this is the end goal of of election. God chooses a part for the good of the whole. Again, he says to Abram, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Okay, why do I keep reiterating this point over and over? It was intentional. Let me say that first. (laughs) But this is why. When God elects you to carry his promise for the sake of the collective whole, friends, hear me, there comes with that a degree of responsibility. Like you are representing something bigger and greater than just simply self. So from the moment Abraham was called by God up into the birth of Jesus Christ, what we have in the biblical narrative is roughly 2,000 years of history. And in those 2,000 years, you walk alongside Israel to see just how they're living out this divine election. They are set apart by God for God's purposes. Again, God would use them to carry the message of salvation to all nations. You know, as Israel attempted to grow into what it meant to be set apart for God, like most all of us growing up, there were many ups and downs along their journey. You know, in 2,000 years of history, uh, for instance, Israel experienced centuries of slavery in Egypt. And once freed from that slavery, they were brought into the land God promised to give them through a covenant he made with ancestor Abraham. Having secured that promised land from foreign nations, God sought to be Israel's one and only king. 
However, that didn't satisfy Israel. They asked for a human king. Now, much to God's disapproval, he gave them a human king. And even though the kingship in Israel would rise to great power under people like King David and Solomon, eventually idolatry and sin brought about God's discipline. Israel would be overthrown by foreign nations and sent away to live as exiles in foreign lands. However, roughly 500 years before Jesus, God brought his chosen people, the Israelites, back to their land. Now here's the reality. Through these 2,000 years of biblical history, when, when Israel takes center stage, it appears that they struggled with something I think we all kind of struggle with, and here it is. Being different is difficult. Isn't it? Listen, friends, don't forget God elected Israel. He set them apart from every nation under the sun to carry out his grand rescue operation for all of creation. God gave them the law to follow, which would set them apart. God gave them, uh, wanted to be their only king, which would set them apart. God gave them prophets who would preach God's word, which would set them apart. (laughs) But sometimes being different is difficult. It's that line most of us have heard out of the mouth of a child. Maybe we even said it when we were children. But mom, Johnny's parents say it's okay. But mom, Johnny's parents let him do it. Johnny's parents let him stay out late. But mom, Johnny's parents let him go to the party. Johnny's parents let him get his ear pierced. (laughs) It's called peer pressure. And it stems from the fact that we feel most comfortable when we're doing things pretty much like everybody else. I remember back in uh, high school, I caved to peer pressure and actually got my left ear pierced. I I looked ridiculous. And I'll never forget my father when I walked into the house. He didn't um, rebuke me. He didn't admonish me. He just simply laughed at me. (laughs) And I should have gotten laughed at. It looked ridiculous but all my friends were doing it, right? You know, for Israel, the peer pressure showed up in very specific ways. The other nation worshipped idol kings that they could see and touch. Their gods were visible and their rules were, were more elastic. So Israel got jealous. Other nations could fight and fornicate as much as they chose. Other nations could pray to multiple gods hoping that at least one would hear them. Other nations had earthly kings they could prop up on pedestals. So Israel started to compromise. They wanted to be like everybody else, even though they knew God had set them apart, that God had elected them to bear his message of salvation. Israel's faith began to get watered down. They eventually, hear this, even abandoned God's call to be the one nation for the sake of all nations. They forfeited their election to be just like everybody else. Let me ask you a question. Church in America, does this sound at all like us? You know, if I'm being honest, I'm not sure that we as a church in America really live all that differently than anyone else in our society, right? I mean, we squabble over petty issues. We entrench ourselves in our opinions. We write people off who frustrate us. We don't really like to be inconvenienced for the sake of others. We hoard stuff. We pad our bank accounts. We avoid people who make us uncomfortable. We do what makes us feel good in the moment, even if we know it's morally wrong. To put it bluntly, We make our lives about us rather than about the one who has called us to live differently. To live differently so we could point people to him. We, like Abraham and Israel as a church in America, are blessed to be a blessing, right? But so often we forget our witness. And so often we we just go through our days forgetting that there is a bigger story going on here. And we as a church have a specific role in it. Listen, friends, God's desire was for Israel to stand out because of their mercy, fidelity, and love. God wanted Israel to love him and in doing so, love all the people around them in ways that led to flourishing and unity and, well, shalom, wholeness. Israel would be the catalyst for God's great rescue operation. 
You know, humanity was created for perfect union with God and with each other. Israel was set apart to exemplify that, but they didn't do it. So God's great rescue plan went into motion. The promise found in Genesis 3 verse 15 was coming and sin would one day be crushed forever. You you have to wonder upon Israel's return from exile 500 years before Christ. You got to wonder, how would God's original promise to a man named Abraham be fulfilled, right? How would the nations of the earth be blessed through this beaten up and all too willing to compromise group of people? For years, The question went unanswered. Then, just when all seemed hopeless, something unexpected happened in a forgotten corner of the Roman Empire. Just when all seemed lost, hope pierced through the dawn of a day. In a nothing town called Nazareth, an unmarried teenage girl got pregnant and the world would never be the same. You know something, the Old Testament can be incredibly daunting and confusing, can't it? However, we need to remember that the Bible was written for us, but not to us. What do I mean by that? Friends, we are not the Israelites. We do not live under the old covenant. And so we should probably expect that some of the passages in the biblical narrative may strike us kind of strange. However, that doesn't mean those Old Testament passages are irrelevant or false to us. It just simply means we need to interpret them through the lens of Christ Jesus. And we will see next week, it is in Jesus that God's rescue plan reaches its climax. What started with Abraham and Israel, friends, hear me, finds its completion in Christ Jesus. But for today, I'd like to circle back to Abraham. You know, he heard the voice of God, he believed it, and he started packing his bags. I'm sure in that moment, he seemed crazy to his neighbors. I'm sure his community wondered, what in the heck was this guy doing? I'm sure his sanity was even questioned, and I'm willing to bet he wasn't, it wasn't easy for him. But there was a story unfolding, friends, and Abraham was a part of it. He was chosen by God, elected to be a blessing to others and to future generations. He was different, and that difference was intentional. You know, praise be to God for creating for us a way out of our brokenness and sin. And also praise be to God for his call upon us, the church, to use our days, to use the blessing he has bestowed upon us to reach out and bless others by connecting people to him through the way we love, through the way we extend our grace and our mercy. Let us pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, I thank you so much that as we dive into the biblical narrative, we are reminded, first and foremost, that we were created by you to be in perfect union, to be in perfect communion, not only with you, but with one another. Lord, even though sin has entered into the story and has broken what, we have, what you have given us initially, we thank you that a great rescue plan went underway through Israel and that reached its climax in Jesus, your Son and our Savior. God, you blessed Abraham to be a blessing to other people. You blessed your church to also be a blessing to other people. So Lord, may we use the blessings you have bestowed upon us to reach out into the world around us and to connect all to your son, Jesus Christ, so they, like us, can grow up healthy in you and also live courageously with the way we love. It's in your name we pray. Amen.